Good morning. Welcome to uh, Grand Rounds. Uh, this month we have Dr. Corsi, who uh, she earned her bachelor's, master's, and doctor of occupational therapy at uh, Misericordia University. She is a certified uh, geriatric care manager and a certified stroke rehab specialist, and she's finishing up her MBA at Moravian College. Um, she's here to talk to us about neuro rehab and uh, utilizing uh, network continuum to uh, enhance care of these patients. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Corsi. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Everyone awake on a Wednesday at 7 a.m.? Yes? Ready to get your learn on? Steve is. Um, so first and foremost, thank you, Steve and St. Louis Physical Therapy Grand Rounds for having me here today to talk to you a little bit about neuro rehab, a network continuum approach. So we're going to take a little bit of a different perspective with this, just in terms of not specifically going over neuro interventions per se, but more so from a global overview where St. Luke's University Health Network is going from a network continuum, um, the team and committee that we built to kind of bridge the gap and break down the silos from acute care to acute rehab and outpatient and facilitating functional outcomes to measure pro objective progress throughout the network continuum and kind of making sure that we can all work together as a team to facilitate best care and best quality care deliverance for our patients, for our neural population specifically. So we're going to talk a little bit about the network and where it's going in the future, healthcare reform and how that's impacting us as clinicians, the evolution of neuro rehab um, as it moves forward, and also the functional outcome measures that we're going to be piloting and trialing, as well as partnership with local academia and doing future research to progress the neuro rehab continuum in St. Luke's University Health Network. So just for some disclaimers, the planning committee as well as myself have no financial relationships to disclose. The course objectives, these were the objectives that were listed on the flyer that Steve was kind enough to send out to you folks um, in the email blast. So just to paraphrase a little bit of that, you're going to see this slide recur throughout the rest of the presentation to let you know where we're going and how things tie together um, from an objective standpoint. So to start, we're going to do a little bit of an overview and relevance. So myself as a clinician, I'm an occupational therapy by trade. Um, I'm a St. Luke's born and raised clinician, so I was actually a level two student here nine years ago, um, and I spent most of my time with all of you folks that are here in acute care for eight years in the ICU and med surge P7 neuro units, um, and served as most recently the acute care neuro rehab team leader for PTOT speech. Spent a lot of time on acute rehab with my ARC friends over there um, a couple years ago, and now have shifted into the outpatient world, um, where I now serve as the director of outpatient neuro OT. So I think that experience has kind of afforded me a unique perspective to see how each team works beautifully individually in acute care, acute rehab to outpatient, but then also offering an affordance of a perspective of how can we make all of these teams work together instead of individual systems as a more comprehensive neuro rehab team throughout the continuum. So just an overview and relevance in terms of patient populations today. We're in the midst of a shift in the well elderly movement. We know that a lot of our patients are getting older. They're living longer. Um, they're living better quality lives. So they want to deinstitutionalize these folks and keep them in the homes to optimize their quality of life and live as possible and safely as possible. So aging baby boomers over the next 30 years are also going to increase. So we'll go over a little bit of statistics as to the shift in the age of population that we're going to be seeing from a neuro rehab standpoint in the community as well. Baby boomers are also the sandwich generation. So not only are they taking care of their parents, but they're also taking care and raising their own children. So they're more aware of the options and opportunities for them from a neuro rehab standpoint, and they're going to advocate more. There's more access to technology. People are looking things up more. So we're going to be met with a little bit more resistance and not necessarily have to be defensive per se, but prepared more so as to what the options are and to be able to communicate that effectively to the patients as well as their loved ones in the future. Just some statistics in terms of the aging population. 34 Americans are providing care to older families. And the shift is going to be in the population of 65 and older. So, for example, in 2000, one in, five, one in eight Americans were 65 and older. By 2030, one in five Americans will be 65 and older. So we're going to see a huge shift in the elderly movement in the communities. Some demographics of the Lehigh Valley. We know that the top two um, occupations in the Lehigh Valley are in healthcare as well as technology. So it's important for us to stay current and stay relevant and how we can offer unique pr perspectives and different programs to keep our patients within the network work as they progress to the network continuum. Some statistics on strokes. Why are we looking at stroke survivors? 
The purpose of today's pr pr presentation is to talk about neuro rehab as a network continuum standpoint. So it makes the most sense to me to start with looking at creating a standard of care for stroke survivors specifically. Why? Because they're the most often seen patient population in neuro that is seen by PT, OT, and speech, and most often research demonstrates progresses best through the network continuum if they get acute care therapy, acute rehab therapy, and outpatient as soon as possible within that three-month window of opportunity for optimal recovery. So we're choosing to work with stroke survivors first as the pilot population to trial and develop a standard of care through the network continuum. And why stop with stroke survivors, potentially roll out different programs as a standard of care for MS, Parkinson's, uh, TBI, spinal cord injury, etc. So kind of looking at stroke survivors as the pilot population, but then transcending to different neuro populations to optimize the standard of care through the network continuum. So as a network, um, Half of all acute care hospitalizations are neurological patients, so that's a large statistic. So think of all those patients that are going through the channels of the network continuum, and most of them are going to be neurological patients. Knowing that research demonstrates the sooner, the faster, the better, the more aggressive rehab they receive, the better their functional outcomes, it makes the most sense to me to create a standard of care to move them through the continuum as soon as possible. Stroke alerts at a recent PI meeting are up 108%. That is a huge statistic. Um, one of the big main factors of that is likely because of the Comprehensive Stroke Center of Excellence that we are now. And having Dr. Marlin and Dr. Oleskin, our neurosurgical interventional radiologists, we are able to do more interventions quickly. So patients are not only getting more medical care faster, they're functionally progressing faster as well. So we're seeing a lot more higher functioning patients because they're getting those interventions sooner instead of having these drastic hemiparetic deficits post-insult. So they're getting better, faster, and more aggressive rehab is needed to facilitate them as well. Healthcare reform is also influencing the push for functional progress. My friends in acute care, you know this. You're doing therapeutic discharging. You're trying to facilitate discharge. You're getting them in, getting them out, and getting to the next level of care. So there's a big push for us to demonstrate functional progress and get patients to where they need to go and also demonstrate why are you recommending what you're recommending, what measures support that, and how can you facilitate their functional progress. In looking at the different acute care settings and acute rehab and outpatient settings, as I mentioned before, every setting functions beautifully as a silo, but what better team could we have if we all work together from a comprehensive standpoint to increase communication, collaboration, and teamwork to facilitate progress through the network continuum? So there's a little bit of a disjointed medical care from transition from setting to setting. Now that outpatient is live with EPIC and electronic medical records, we have a better opportunity to communicate across the network. <clears throat> More overview and relevance. Um, administrative transformations are forcing us to do more with less. We know that staffing is always an ongoing challenge. Um, so with being cost effective, sometimes there's a lack of communication from setting to setting to facilitate discharge. We know that also CMS, Medicare and Medicaid services, are financially reimbursing university health networks if their quality care deliverance and patient satisfaction scores are increased based off their experience um, through the continuum. So it makes sense to create a standard of care to help with that transition to increase the communication and ultimately provide better quality care for our patients. It also promotes a team approach towards comprehensive rehabilitative services. And the most often seen are our stroke survivors in all three settings through the continuum. In terms of how we prioritize our patients, not to say that neurological patients are necessarily more or less deserving of a pulmonary patient. However, we know that research demonstrates the more aggressive rehab that a neurological patient receives within that three month fr fragile period of recovery, the better their outcomes will be. So that's why we're prioritizing neuro patients for the standard of care pilot. Healthcare and acute care, in the past, even in my early career, we were more consultative. So we were evaluating patients, we were discharging them, making the recommendations and not necessarily seeing them for treatment throughout their hospitalization. Now we're shifting to a more rehabilitative model. So in, instead of just making the recommendations, we're trying to rehab them and almost compete with ourselves to see if we can avoid a rehab recommendation and optimize their function to progress them to perhaps home therapies or outpatient instead. So we're seeing them from a more rehabilitative state to treat them while they're in the hospital, getting medically stabilized to get them to the next level. So there's a big push for maximization of independence and function to expedite discharge, but also to get the patient as, bad, as best as possible, as soon as possible. 
Evolution of Rehab Services, we're consultative and therapeutic. So we're really focusing on providing comprehensive assessments also to justify why we're recommending what we're recommending with different levels of care. So it's a refocusing of healthcare goals. It's a new opportunity for us to really develop a knowledge base to be effective, enabling stroke survivors to live more meaningful and productive lives. So we really need to abandon any kind of biomechanical reasoning that we had before and looking at a patient as a robotic uh, company of systems and more so as a comprehensive holism, humanistic approach to really address the person as the person instead of the patient at 724 or 974, looking at Mrs. Smith and all the characteristics to make her a person and focusing on those things for quality care deliverance. So the neuro rehab continuum. <laughs> Looking at developing a standard of care for stroke survivors through the network continuum, what we're proposing is that we've done a lot of research to identify, you know, doing literature reviews, and we'll get to that later, but just in terms of what exactly would be a standard of care for a network continuum in St. Luke. So what we're proposing is creating certain functional outcome measures that are objective to provide on day one of acute care, day one of acute rehab, and day one of outpatient neuro rehab where is the patient at from an objective measure standpoint? So providing these functional objective measures to create data to collect and analyze to measure potential progression or regression throughout the network continuum to hold ourselves accountable. It offers transparency, some ownership and accountability as to are we doing what's best for our patients? Why or why not? And later creating a comparative analysis, piloting certain interventions to trial to see is this intervention, say, for example, trialing constraint induced movement therapy or neurotechnology, is this better to optimize our patient's functional recovery than what we're already doing? So instead of putting the cart before the horse and trialing different interventions, what we need to define first in what we're doing now in the initial phases is identifying what is our current standard of care and what are we doing and how effective is that to establish the baseline. Any questions on any of that so far? No? Okay. I talk very fast, so feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions. Um, I don't mind being interrupted. So I want to be a comfortable environment, so if you have questions, you want to interject, dialogue, feel free. So the neuro rehab continuum. Um, based on my experience with acute care, acute rehab, and outpatient, like I said, it's kind of afforded me a different perspective as to understand and empathize with what the different goals are and how we excel and succeed in each different setting. So acute care is really more so perceived as your therapeutic discharge. So you're evaluating the patient to see what's the longitudinal rehab potential in the early phases working with the medical team, your neurologist, your physiatrist, based on the, ins the insult or the injury to the brain from an imaging standpoint, what is their rehab potential? Do we think that they're gonna make a full recovery? Is it so bad that they're probably likely going to end up being wheelchair bound? What's the best place for them from a discharge standpoint to optimize their quality of life? Are we looking at more compensatory strategies? Are we looking at more rehab strategies? Um, which direction are we going to take and which level of care is the best for them to discharge to? In acute rehab, it's all systems go. It's the rehab model. You're trying to do interventions from an acute rehab standpoint to really optimize and aggressively rehab these patients to their best potential as quickly as possible. For stroke survivors specifically, the typical length of stay in acute care is anywhere from three to five days. Generally speaking, depending on the mechanism of injury and what other surgical interventions they may or may not need, depending on if they start an ICU and go to med surge or just med surge to discharge. Acute rehab is anywhere from seven to 10 days, 10 to 14 days, depending on their um, level of severity. And then they ship to the outpatient world. Outpatient world is really looking at closing that loop. So it's fine tuning the patient's functional progress, assessing where they at in their recovery, partnering and making connections with different community resources to see is this as good as they're going to get? Is this their ceiling level of their functional progress? What else can we do to optimize their progress? Or is this their new norm? And how to facilitate transitioning and coping with that new norm based on their environment and the economic affordances that they have? to maximize their independence. So it's really making that connection to different community specialists, physiatrists, neurologists, neuropsychologists, so, uh, support groups, um, stroke atlas, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit about those different evolving programs and community resources later. So it's important that all of us as clinicians, PTOT speech, in all three settings, we all have the same goal. We all wanna maximize function for the patients. We wanna improve their quality of life. We wanna progress them as quickly as possible. So it's more about working as a team to provide the standard of care and identify how we can hold ourselves accountable and provide best practice through the continuum. 
some of the major goals, I won't read through all of these, but the overview is that we're essentially looking to collaborate, communicate, focus as a team, use the team building model and approach for patient-centered practice, support therapeutic rapport, and really facilitate care coordination through the continuum in all three settings. So where it all began, how did this all start with this idea of creating a standard of care for a neuro rehab network continuum? So when we were going about a year ago looking at moving towards comprehensive stroke center, neuro center of excellence at Stroke PI, we had a meeting and discussed, you know, Dr. Ackerman went to a conference out west and he said that when he brought back that post-stroke depression and anxiety are two of the most underdiagnosed and undertreated post-insult symptoms that we are not addressing as a healthcare whole, not just as therapists, but also as a whole. Um, you know, the neurology team also recognized that. So that was kind of pushed to the forefront, even from a JCO standpoint, um, when we're just a neuro center of excellence, but also becoming a comprehensive center of excellence is how do we address this? So we looked at some of the therapists, you know, and we're usually most often the ones that are doing any kind of functional outcome. So it makes sense to look at the therapy team that works with them frequently. We know our patients talk to us a lot. They kind of disclose a lot of things. They have that personal rapport with us. So it makes sense to have the therapist champion this aspect. So with OT's background in mental health, we, told, we were the ones that were chosen to kind of pilot doing any kind of anxiety and depression screens. And we'll talk about two specific ones that we're doing now. So as we looked at doing anxiety and depression screens, from the Comprehensive Center of Excellence in a JCO standard, we had to measure it through the network continuum. So that's where this all started. So we started doing the anxiety and depression screens in acute care, acute rehab, and outpatient to measure their psychosocial function as they progressed the continuum and as they got more independent. And then we thought if we're doing psychosocial measures, wouldn't it be great if we could do functional measures as well to identify progression and regression? So that's kind of where this all began. <laughs> So we had a meeting of the minds. The stroke PI team involved into a sublet group of OT and PT of acute care, acute rehab, outpatient, physiatry, and neurology. My speech therapy friends, you might be wondering, well, why isn't speech therapy involved? Um, so we dialogued with acute care, acute rehab, and outpatient speech therapists. And just by pure nature of how their role differs in all three settings in terms of dysphagia management, dysphagia in language, and then high-level COG, some language and some dysphagia in outpatient, there really wasn't a measure that was accessible, applicable to all three settings yet. So that's going to take a little bit more time to kind of develop. So for now, we're trialing developing a standard of care for PT and OT, and then getting speech on board later to kind of really close the loop. So we are invested in a continuum of care to collaborate on stroke survivor door rehab through all three settings. So a lot of the questions that came up and dialogued through these conversations was, how can we make this process better? What are we doing similarly? What are other settings doing that differently? What are we already doing or not doing? What are we measuring? What are we assessing? What assessments are we already using and how effective are they? Other questions that came up. What literature is, uh, reviews exist, if any? What measures are valid, reliable, and have good inter reader reliability across the network continuum? What universities can we partner with? What programs are out there in terms of OTPT and speech in the Lehigh Valley, if any? What's our PICO question? Going back to school, thinking about PICO questions and research, where do you start? How does it begin? What is our standardization of care and how do we define that? What interventions do we trial? Do we start with the standard of a care or trial neurotechnology? It was very overwhelming the first meeting that we had. There was tons of questions that's, that were strewn around, lots of brainstorming. Everybody just kind of took a big breath at the end and said, okay, this is a big project, where do we start? So it was kind of going back to the drawing board and just like we do with our patients, you create a plan of care. You establish short-term goals and long-term goals. Nothing is gonna be done overnight. Research is not easy. So we established short-term achievable goals and started working through that process. So our initial phases, we met with the multidisciplinary neuro rehab team leaders across the continuum to get feedback from acute care, acute rehab to outpatient. We also met with the sales to dialogue and discuss some potential research and partnership for the future so that we have that research opportunity from the academia standpoint, as well as later incorporating students into the process. We all know that time constraints is a huge barrier in any setting that you work in. So having the students be able to collect that data, pilot some of the interventions, um, analyze some of the results and help us with that process is always helpful. We also wanted to identify some of the effective measures and we're going to go through some of the measures that we ended up choosing to pilot. Um, develop competencies to ensure that not only 
Are we doing the measures in all three settings, but every clinician is competent in administering those measures as well, so that there is good inter-rater reliability across the settings? We rolled out the measures. As with any process, there were some kinks and bumps in the road. We had to identify the strengths, the weaknesses, the challenges, and the barriers, and kind of re repeat and revise. So some of the outcome measures that we chose to pilot. There's a whole bunch of them for OT and PT. We'll go through some of them. Some of them might be familiar to you. Other ones might be brand new. Um, if you have any questions about them, certainly feel free to ask, raise your hand. Um, know that these measures were piloted. Um, we had competencies done for all the clinicians. We trialed them and the settings, and some of them worked well. Some of them didn't work so well. And that's the nature of research. You're not always going to have the right thing perfect every single time the first time you do it. It's a constant recheck, revise, um, repeat. So it's really creating a dynamic evolution of learning and self-checking to kind of always ask yourself what's going well, what's not going so well, and how can we make this better. So from an OT standpoint, we looked a lot more at function as well as that psychosocial component for anxiety and depression screens. And then physical therapy, looked, we looked at more at mobility, gait, balance. So from the ICF, you can see the different areas of the human in terms of how these different measures fit in with the different components of function. So health conditions was a lot of the PT assessments with the functional mobility, balance, gait, indexes. The participation was more so perceived in terms of function, so the modified Rankin and the Barthel index. And then the personal factors, environmental factors, we perceived as more so biopsychosocial influences, and that's the anxiety and depression screens. And then with the body functions, that's just pure functional upper or low extremity um, recovery. So the Orpington Prognostic Scale, it's a four-part test, very quick and easy to administer. Um, all of these tests that we're going to go over today are also free. They are easy to administer. They're quick, effective, and easy. Um, they do have all objective outcomes, so they, it offers that numerical raw score to be able to capture the functional status of the patient. You can just simply type them into Google. They're a one-page handout. They're all really accessible. So if you want to use any of these and trial them in your clinics, feel free. So the Orpington Prognostic Scale is looking at more so triaging from a functional prognostic recovery standpoint. Discharge planning, what's most appropriate and what coincides with what you're recommending, usually in acute care and acute rehab. So if you're saying the patient really would benefit more so from acute rehab, you're likely, and it's pretty accurate. I mean, the people that have used it, you know, feel free to chime in. It's, it's pretty consistent and accurate with what you're recommending. If you think that somebody is a good acute rehab candidate, they usually end up falling within this realm, 3.2 to 5.2 in that middle realm, because we know that the moderate to severe deficit stroke survivor responds best to rehab. So that kind of coincides with what we recommend. The lower the number, the more high functioning that they are. So that 3.2 and less it's more so of folks that would benefit from either home therapies, a visit or two to ensure the environment is safe, do an environmental assessment, a home, assessment, a home safety assessment, and then get them to outpatient. The patients that are 5.2 or higher, they have the more severe deficits and will likely be more dependent, either requiring 24-hour care at home or a more skilled nursing facility, slower-paced rehab. The motricity index and trunk control test. So this is more looking at upper and low extremity motor function. So it's a measure of limb impairment for the paretic size of patients who have had a stroke. And that's the motricity index specifically. So on a scale of 0 to 100, 100 being independent, normal function, 0 being complete paresis, um, you only need a 2.5 centimeter cube. So there's not a whole lot of equipment involved, and it's very quick to test. So it's just a matter of how much movement do they have. Um, the trunk control test is looking at the power of core musculature. So there's four simple movements. You just need a mat or a bed, depending on what setting you're in. Rolling from the paretic side to the non-paretic side, sit to supine, balancing at the edge of bed, and again, just scoring them on a scale of 0 to 100. 100 is normal. 0 is complete impairment. The NeuroQOL anxiety short form and the NeuroQOL depression short form, um, these two are pretty similar. Um, QOL stands for obviously quality of life, so it's, you know, for our outpatient friends that are doing the PHQ-9, if they score positively on any of these PHQ-9s, then you can follow up with an anxiety or a depression short form. Um, most of our OTs are doing that in our neuroclinics for um, assessing anxiety and depression already. 
Um, but if you want to use this as like a triage to see if their PHQ-9 score is positive, then you can follow up with one of these assessments. These are also free, um, easily accessible. There are pediatric versions as well. Um, there are also stroke fatigue NeuroQL short forms as well. Um, if you just type in NeuroQL, there's a whole manual that's downloadable as a PDF um, to tell you how to score things if you want to try out different measures additionally. There's also a neuro uh, pain assessment too. So if you have post-stroke pain syndrome or upper extremity, lower extremity spasticity, chronic pain, you can do an assessment on that also. So it's essentially a Likert scale. There's eight questions, and they answer in terms of never to always, and each response quantitates with a raw score. So you just add up the scores in total. When we met with Dr. Prasila from Internal Medicine, Dr. Ackerman from Neurology, and Dr. J from Neuropsych, their magic number was 25. So on a scale of zero to 40, the higher the score, the more severe the symptoms, 25 and higher was that magic number for, that warrants a threshold for treatment. So if they score a 25 or higher, it's recommended that they follow up with neuropsychology. We'll talk a little bit about neuropsychology and the difference and why that's a special and unique discipline that really should be seen by stroke survivors. So 25 or higher indicates further treatment, either by medicinal management, anti-anxiety, antidepressants, or a follow-up with Dr. J or her team for neuropsychology for psychotherapies. And the depression for short form functions similarly. It only takes about 10 to 15 minutes to administer. The other nice thing about this, it's, it's more or less a self-report questionnaire. So if you are setting the patient up, you want to go start them on the different task or set up a different piece of equipment, you can have them do the self-report on their own while you're setting things up and then circle back with them. So it doesn't take a whole lot of time to administer. They timed up a go. Most of the PTs in the room are probably familiar with this. It measures mobility, balance, and locomotor performance. Um, you just need a chair with armrests, three meters marked, and a stopwatch. It assesses any risk for falls and community dwelling ad adults' um, balance and mobility skills. So a score of 8.5 seconds has been used as a maximum cutoff for stroke survivors. 14 seconds is a cutoff for identifying high fall risk. So the norm is less than 10 seconds. If you a higher functioning patient and you really want to get their dynamic balance while they're multitasking, thinking while they're thinking, if you will, you can do the timed up and go cognitive and dual tasks. So it's basically doing the same measures of the timed up and go but adding a functional component. So for example, carrying a glass of water and counting backwards from 100 by 7. So thinking while you're thinking as well as mobilizing. 10 meter walk test, it's measuring walking speed for short distances. You just need a stopwatch and a 10 meter mark path. It's an average of three trials to determine gait speed. So normal gait speed is anything more than 1.3 meters per second. And this is essentially telling you how safe they are from a setting standpoint. So household ambulators, community ambulators, how safe are they and how much are they a fall risk? It only takes about five minutes to complete and it's really predictive of future health status, functional declines and fall risks. Five times sit to stand, it's a measure of low extremity strength, endurance, and balance. You just need a chair and a stopwatch. You record literally the amount of time it takes the patient to perform five times sit to stand. So it's telling you the risk for falls and are they community dwelling adults and how safe are they with that. Um, the norms are also provided in terms of age range, the expected norms per second. The PASS, the Postural Assessment Scale for Stroke Patients. So this one is a great one for your lower functioning patients. If there are more in the subacute or chronic phases from an outpatient standpoint, you're seeing them one, two, three years, maybe post-injury. Um, you know, they have a lot of spasticity, their max assist stamp pivot transfer, they're using slide boards. This is the kind of assessment that you can use for, for those lower level folks. Um, and your acute care patients, so if you're working with them in the ICU, they're a craniectomy, craniotomy, they're lower functioning, they're max assist of two, you're dangling them on the side of the bed, this is the assessment that you can use for those patients also. So it's a total of 12 positions, postures tested, um, you just need an exam table, a mat, or a bed, depending on what setting you're in. And it's a good assessment, like I said, for lower level strokes. Most respond 14 to 30 days post-CVA, and it's a little bit better than the trunk impairment scale for predicting function. The Barthel Index and the Modified Rankin, these two are really looking at more so function in terms of ADLs after an injury. So the Barthel Index is similar to the Orpington Prognostic Recovery in terms of the outcome scores is really telling you essentially how much care they're going to require. 
So the lower the score on this measure, the more impairments they have. So the lower the score of 0 to 39 likely require 24-hour care either in the home or more skilled nursing facility patient. 40 to 59 and so on, you can see that the higher the level of score, the higher functioning that they are, the less care that they'll need. And it's a very black and white objective score. So sometimes this one can be a little gray if they're higher functioning, but they have cognitive impairments. Their score might be a little bit skewed in terms of saying that they're more functional than they are because it doesn't account for cognition. And that's one of the things that we talked about with revising the standard of care that we're developing through the network continuum is, well, who's going to account for cognition? So knowing that OT is looking at function and psychosocial implications, we're probably going to also involve the MOCA along the way because the MOCA is really good for longitudinal reliability because there's three versions that we can use in all three settings to measure cognitive um, impairments and progression. So we'll probably likely incorporate the MOCA as well through the process. The modified Rankin is um, very black and white. It also identifies level of functionality and levels of independence on a scale of zero to death. So it's a little, um, little objective. It's a le little less objective. Um, it's a little bit more vague. So there isn't a whole lot of wiggle room with that. And it also doesn't account for um, cognitive impairments, but it does give you an overall functional raw score. Um, the Barthel index is utilized a little bit more frequently. And Jess Trout, the program coordinator for um, stroke, also assesses the Barthel index from a longitudinal standpoint. She checks what it is in acute care um, and then discusses with the patient acute rehab and outpatient what their score is on the Barthel by asking them certain questions from an interview standpoint. So it makes sense that if we were able to do this in acute care, acute rehab, and outpatient, she'd be able to pull those data from EPIC and facilitate a report to measure, again, their progression and regression through the continuum. So neuro rehab technology. So as we're kind of evolving the standard of care, you know, we performed a literature review. As we all know, literature reviews always state the conclusion is there is no conclusion. There needs to be more research. Um, so going back to the drawing board and looking at all the different articles that are present, there wasn't any that we really came across, maybe one or two, about a network continuum neuro rehab standard of care. Um, some of the different research articles we found Acute care was very heavy with early mobilization. We know that as key for progressing patients in acute care. It's all about early prevention, um, you know, mobilizing them, prevent further complications, prevent aspiration pneumonias, clots, um, you know, decreasing edema, improving functionality, decreasing their psychosocial depression from being cooped up in a hospital bed. You know, those sorts of articles were very heavy in acute care. And acute rehab was more trialing different interventions. So neurotechnology, constraint-induced movement therapy, PNF, NDT, what's most effective, mirror therapy, et cetera. Um, outpatient was very similar to the acute rehab in terms of trialing different interventions, but nothing really looked at a comprehensive um, network continuum neuro rehab standpoint. So it's a kind of a unique opportunity to create that through a network continuum since we are a very close knit network that functions well individually to come together as a group. There was some articles also on figuring out when do you switch from rehabilitative to compensatory. And a lot of the results for that were also inconclusive because as we know, stroke survivors are all very different. What one patient's MRI looks like, their functionality may be very different and vice versa. So the next patient will be different and so on. So it was hard to kind of gauge a specific time frame as to once three months hit, then you switch to compensatory because that wasn't necessarily the findings. We identified a PICO question. This is our tentative PICO question. Um, and again, we're constantly revisiting and revising things, but this may tentatively be uh, the direction that we take from a research standpoint. So in adults diagnosed with CVA between the ages of 18 and 90 that progress through a neuro rehab network continuum, i.e. acute care, acute rehab, and outpatient, how effective is our current standard of care for improving overall functional recovery? So with that, we would be looking at length of stay, what are the functional outcome measures demonstrating? How quickly are they progressing from a functional standpoint and from acute care to outpatient and acute rehab in between? And are we identifying interventions or variables for future comparison? Once we identify this baseline standard of care, now let's trial different interventions. Is our standard of care better or more effective than neurotechnology or constraint-induced movement therapy? Or there's some research that says, you know, from a PT standpoint, if patients get 10,000 steps within a day, whether simulated or actual steps, and they progress faster from a long-term standpoint. So trialing those different interventions and seeing how our current standard of care measures up is the future goal. 
So we also looked at standard of care versus neurotechnology. So what kind of neurotechnology will we implement? What kind of things are out there? And other things to consider would be, first and foremost, obviously cost has to be financially feasible, portability, and knowing the different settings and the nature of the different settings, um, ease of access, and how applicable is it for PT, OT, and speech, as well as utilizing it across the setting. So having a giant monitor and outpatient is great, but when you're looking at acute care, if they're in the ICU or on med surge, there's other different medical things that are going to be involved in terms of lines and tubes and wires, so you have to accommodate for that. So some of the things that we were able to get approval for an outpatient is the BioNess interactive therapy systems, the BITS, the interactive metronome, the Music Love, and the Sable mobile arm support, and we also trialed the Sable Rejoice. So some of these pieces of equipment we found are primarily the BITS is really um, beneficial for all three settings, acute care, acute rehab, and outpatient, because of the nature of its ability to upgrade and downgrade, not only with size, but also level of difficulty. So what we have now is the large screen for the outpatient world. There is a smaller screen that's a little bit more um, static for acute rehab, and then there is a bedside uh, size for acute care that's portable also and on wheels. So we're thinking that this may be the direction we take in terms of the future potential neuro rehab technology intervention that we trial. Um, it's also developed by BioNess. BioNess is a uh, neural modulation for um, electrical stimulation for neuromuscular retraining. So we use that in outpatient as well. And our BioNess representatives were telling us that a lot of their research is based on utilizing it as an early neuromuscular re-education in acute care to optimize the potential for upper and low extremity neuroplastic recovery. So using the BioNess in tandem with the BITS, potentially in all three settings, may be the direction that we take to pilot a comparative analysis down the road. Interactive metronome, um, it, both the BITS and the interactive metronome are more virtual reality. So it's working on all three disciplines can benefit from it, uh, more cognition, vision, perception, balance, um, rhythmic coordination, um, static and dynamic balance. So it's really multifaceted and really beneficial for all three settings. The music love is more for an upper extremity fine motor, gross motor, um, fine motor strength and coordination, um, neuromuscular re-education tool. And then the stable mobile arm support is more of a proximal offloading to facilitate distal functional movements. And the stable rejoice is very similar to the bits and the interactive metronome, um, just in terms of that virtual reality to offer visual, perceptual, cognition, language, and uh, functional movements as well. And the Sable Rejoice was trialed in the ARC, as well as for us in outpatient, is currently at our Tillman site um, being trialed with Patrick and his team. So evolving programs, where are we going for the future and what community resources are available? So when we're looking at progressing these patients through the network continuum, you know, they're all coming to the Bethlehem campus, they're coming to the mothership, to the hub, to get the special interventions, to get the complex care that they need, and then they're going back to their communities afterwards. So there are different uh, neuro clinics that are available to help progress them through that continuum. So we have Lehighton near our St. Luke's Minor folks, Phillipsburg near Warren, Tillman Street near Allentown, and 8th Avenue in Bethlehem from our St. Luke's Bethlehem patients. All the neurotechnology that I mentioned currently is at 8th Avenue. We have the bits, we're tentatively awaiting the rest of the technology soon, um, but most of that will be housed at the 8th Avenue in Bethlehem site in hopes that as we demonstrate progress, we can potentially roll it out to our other different uh, clinics in the area. Um, our fitness to drive also is an opportunity for patients that as they progress to the neuro rehab continuum, sometimes neurology will recommend, based on your insult and after your stroke, it's recommended that you cease driving until you have further follow-up. There's the follow-up, so they can progress from acute care, acute rehab to outpatient after they finish their cognitive therapy, vision therapy with us, um, then they can potentially get the fitness to drive evaluation at our clinic to assess their safe abilities to re-engage in driving. We also have our physiatrist now, an outpatient, Dr. Sate, who's with us today. Say hi. <laughs> um, so Dr. Sate has come to us from the Acute Rehab Center. So now we have a great resource to be able to bridge that gap and again make those connections for patients to have follow-up from not only a rehab standpoint but also from a medicinal standpoint to have that carryover and follow through for continuity care from not only a rehab but also a medicine standpoint. Um, we also have Dr. Telly. Um, he is going to be doing our Botox and he is going to be the only spasticity clinic in Lehigh Valley. We have other physiatrists that are doing um, Botox as well but 
Um, he's the only one that's going to be specifically targeting spasticity in terms of upper and low extremity management. So acute and chronic and subacute strokes that have any kind of spasticity or tonal management, um, that's going to be done at the 8th Avenue office as well in partnership with our local orthotics and orthotists that can kind of help to do more conservative means first to trial different um, bracing measures um, in tandem with following up with any kind of Botox injections as needed. Neuropsychology, our Bethlehem Psychological Associates team across from the Bethlehem campus, um, they're the ones that can really help with that psychotherapy, biopsychosocial intervention. If their PHQ-9 or their NeuroQL anxiety and depression screens score positively, they're really having a hard time coping, body acceptance, um, depressive, anxious episodes, if they need follow-up from that medicinal or psychotherapy management, um, they're the team that we're referring to currently. Dr. J may be familiar with on the ARC. She also sees patients in the community as well as Dr. DeMarco. And if you have any patients that would benefit from them, you can just give the number um, to the patient for them to call and uh, let their attending know that you're recommending follow-up. Stroke Atlas is our social Social Stroke Survivor Support Group. It was being hosted at um, 8th Avenue in Bethlehem, but I believe it's moving to St. Luke's Allentown. Yes? Yeah, okay. Um, so it's moving to our St. Luke's Allentown um, hospital in the near future. So that's a great resource for patients to have as well as their caregivers because a lot of times the focus is so much so on the stroke survivor that we forget the caregivers and how much it impacts them in the patient's recovery and it's a complete lifestyle change. So kind of adding that opportunity for a safe zone to kind of discuss and cope with each other and def different stroke survivors and what helped them to progress through the continuum and adjust to this difference in lifestyle. So partnerships with academia and future research goals. So what we're doing is we're incorporating academia research and student partnership currently from DeSales University PT program in hopes that as Moravian develops their OT program in about June of next year, as well as their speech program, then we can have speech come on board and kind of facilitate different research um, specific topics from OT, PT, and speech standpoint regarding the standardization of care. So we're looking at collecting data, really implementing functional objective outcome measures through all three settings, running reports through the electronic medical records to be able to analyze outcomes, hopefully facilitate some kind of functional outcomes to demonstrate the standard of care and how effective it is across the network continuum and publish that and, pu and publicly you know, promote that at different local, state, and national conferences. So the overview, health networks need new approaches to improve community and patient communication and patient satisfaction. We're also reimbursed based off quality care deliverance. So if we can increase communication, collaboration, and teamwork from a network continuum, patients in a very unfamiliar, tumultuous time period of their life may have a better perception of care and a better comfort as they progress through this functional recovery. So it's really working on breaking down the gap and this, breaking down the silos to work as a cohesive unit through the network. The future of neuro rehab, we're looking at expanding beyond the stroke survivor community. So because we're starting with stroke survivors, as they are most often seen by all three disciplines and all three settings, wouldn't it be great if we could also expand to concussions and MS and Parkinson's, et cetera. So really looking at optimizing a standard of care for all neuro patients to progress them. And it's important for us to, as clinicians, to be held accountable and offer transparency and accountability in terms of objective measures to justify why we're recommending what we're recommending and also support it from an evidence-based practice standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's also important for us to, moving forward, look at different interventions, continuing educations, and neurotechnology. There's always things that are evolving and changing. There's new opportunities all the time. So it's important for us to be in the know as to what's the current and latest research. So we're looking for a big shift, we all know this, in evidence-based practice. And all clinicians acknowledge from a survey standpoint that there needs to be more research. All research studies conclude it's inconclusive because there needs to be more research. And we all know that it needs to be done, but few are actually doing it clinically. A lot of the big barriers are time constraints. I just don't have the time. I don't really know where to start. It's very overwhelming. I don't know how to begin. Partner with local academia because they have those resources and they have the students that can partner with us as a university health network to help us facilitate gathering that data. And in conclusion, it's more important for us to facilitate quality care deliverance and look at identifying a standard of care through the network continuum to really optimize patient excellence, patient experience um, from a neuro rehab recovery standpoint. Any questions? I know I talked really fast, so I apologize. Leah, when you 
Yes. Yeah, so um, for those that are on the computer, the question was, is do the Lehighton and the Warren campuses also have OT, PT, and speech that do COG and vision? Um, so Warren does have OT, and Miners also has OT, and Warren has speech. I believe Lehighton has speech also. Um, we're looking at setting up a meeting with the Warren campus to start to kind of um, exchange information and education together to see exactly what they're doing and what we're doing to make sure that we are um, consistent across um, both clinics. So that is upcoming and in the works to kind of plan a meeting with them to ensure that, you know, if there's things that they excel in that we can benefit from and vice versa, there's going to be a good exchange of education and mentorship and information with that. Molly. Um. I know because of like, as far as the acute rehab using the thin versus like the bar bell and the mm -hmm. modified rank, and like have you found anything or in the research that correlates that, those two things together? Or, you know? um, so the question was is there an acute rehab they use um, the. Emily just responded, Lee Heighton does have speech OT and PT. Thank you. Um, so and Molly's question was is. The acute rehab uses the FIM. Is there any correlation with the Barthel and the modified Rankin for that? Um, the answer is unfortunately no. So that's kind of the struggle that we're having is there's really limited research. So finding functional measures that are applicable towards all three settings is difficult. I know that with acute rehab and outpatient, we can use the FIM. Um, in acute care, we trial the alpha FIM before, um, and that was very tedious and time consuming. So that's why we're trying to find different measures that are applicable towards all three settings. So. Again, we're kind of in that development phase where what's available and what would be most practical to utilize across the continuum. Yes? Have you ever considered using or including home care in your continuum? Yes, we did think about um, including home care in the continuum. Um, and what we were thinking is more so looking at outpatient as the place for more neural rehab technology. Um, so we did look at, you know, talking with Diane Ancrum with uh, VNA to discuss incorporating uh, home therapies onto that as well. That is a potential opportunity for the future. But just in terms of proximity and ability for flexibility and time constraints, we were looking at all three settings first, um, just because we know that most often stroke survivors progress to outpatient from the ARC more so than home care. So we were kind of looking at outpatient there are a lot first. Of people that we see at home that can't get the ARC, considering the environment they're living in. Sure. Yeah, and that's a great opportunity that we could incorporate home care into the continuum also in the future. Absolutely. Julia, yeah. they start the Botox management clinic yet or no? Dr. Telly is taking some patients. Yeah, Dr. Sate wants to interject for that too. Um, so with the spasticity clinic, um, Dr. Telly is starting the Botox itself for upper and lower limb on Fridays. And um, I'm doing all the medication management for spasticity as well as all the bracing, um, as well as um, I'm going to be I'm starting to do some of the cervical dystonia management as well, and possibly some Botox for that additionally. So that's kind of how we've started the spasticity clinic between the two of us. Um, I'm also located in addition to Eighth Avenue at um, Citronia Road in Allentown, so I've expanded the two sites officially, um, and hopefully that'll help the whole network with all the spasticity management that's needed out there. Mm -hmm. What's the easiest way to refer the patient to you guys? So um, we were, myself and Dr. Telly, we're both part of the neurosciences department. Both of our clinics are part of the outpatient neurology clinics. Okay. So it is the um, main number for scheduling for neurology, which would be the 526-5210. And that's good for any site. Um, you just have to uh, you know, let, let them know that, that they, they can schedule with either one of us. Um, I tend to do a lot of initial assessments, and then I send them to him for Botox when I know that they're they're in need of that. Um, so that's kind of what we've been doing so far. The other way to do things is in Epic, since most of us, with the exception of home care, that, that's on Epic right now, you can always message us 
through the patient's chart, and I know a few of you have already done that, which has is, is worked out really well, um, to let us know, myself or Dr. Telly, to let us know that, hey, this is a patient that we think needs to be evaluated, and we, either myself or him, can always facilitate getting that patient in the clinic as well. Um, so as long as you do it through the patient's chart, you go through the, um, I don't even know what it's, I think it's the messenger. I don't know if you guys have, have the had that. Some of you do, I know, because I've gotten your messages. As long as you go through there, find your name, and send us a message um, with any of your thoughts and ideas. It's extremely helpful. And of course, you can always uh, page or reach me anytime through the operator. Additionally, if you ever have questions. Thank you. Yeah. And they can also request a PM&R consult as well. Yeah, correct? so um, to both myself, Dr. Telly, Dr. Patel, and some of you have met Dr. Davis, who's a new physiatrist, which joined us um, on the ARC. He'll also be doing consult and outpatient eventually as well. Um, we are doing consults both at St. Luke's Bethlehem as well as St. Luke's Allen. <laughs> So um, Dr. Katara has been doing some of the consults at St. Luke's Anderson. Um, so we're at all three campuses um, with, with some presence, and we're really trying to build those consult services as well. So you can always request a physiatry consult at the Bethlehem and Allentown sites for sure. Anderson, um, it's not every day. It's kind of on a as-needed basis there, but you're, you're welcome to put in a consult as well. I'll mute you here. Sure, Mike. Thank you. Yep. So, one more question. Sure. Um, when are you looking for us to give the standardized or those assessments? Are you looking for us to do it on day one of each level of case? Or are you looking for us to do it on the first day we see them and then hopefully before they discharge to the next setting? I think it would make the most sense to do it on the first day of admission in all three settings so that you have that establishment of baseline and then in hopes that you know we're trying to schedule patients as soon as possible for outpatient as soon as they leave you guys from the ARC so that you know within a couple of days they're coming into us to get an evaluation and then we can do the assessments again um, because my fear would be that if you do it on day one and day of discharge in acute rehab maybe they have an appointment two days later um, then they have to do the assessments again so I mean, for me anyway, you know, it's constantly a re revising process, but I would think it would make the most sense to do it on day one of each setting. Yeah. With, with all those, uh, first of all, great talk. Thank um, you. With the, um, uh, all the different assessments, you have six on mm -hmm. uh, both arms. Yes. Um, which, it's a lot of measures. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the plans and have, what are the plans to reduce those to something more uh, long-term manageable? And then also, have you noticed any patterns that um, some are more useful? I, I mm -hmm. know you kind of mentioned a little bit, but have you guys found any conclusions about uh, what's yes. more useful yet? Yes, yes, yes. So one of the biggest um, constraints that we found is that we had a little bit too many going on. There was too many arms floating in both directions of PT and OT. So again, that's why we're kind of in that revision stage where we're back to the drawing board and saying, OK, so some of these were really great. Some of these were not so great. So how can we minimize it to maybe one or two um, per OT and PT for time constraints that's more applicable. So we are in those phases of kind of reducing and figuring out which ones are more beneficial through all three settings with working with the different rehab team leaders from all three settings. So for PT's sake, anyway, we're looking at more so maybe one gate and one balance. Um, for OT, looking at maybe the psychosocial, a cog and like a quick barthel just to get a function um, that don't take a whole lot of time. So we are looking at reducing those to make it more concise. Um, in the initial phases, we're kind of trialing a bunch of them to see which ones were effective, which ones take more time, which ones were easier to administer. So assessing the practicality and the risk, realistic applicability of all of them was the initial phase, and now we're kind of revising and revisiting that. Any other questions? No? Thank you, guys. They're separate, so they're two separate measures. Yeah, so they're different questions. Yeah. Yes. Correct. And make sure if you're from New Jersey, you sign out. And anybody online, make sure you email me for a quiz. Thank you.